Good afternoon. My name is Father Antonio Lopez. I'm the uh, Provost Dean of the uh, Pontifical John Paul II Institute here at uh, Catholic U. We have the honor to be co-sponsors with this uh, this confer wonderful conference, and then I was asked to to moderate this uh, this panel this afternoon. The first speaker uh, is an esteemed colleague of mine, um, Margaret McCarthy. She uh, she graduated from uh, the John Paul II Institute uh, in um, in Rome and uh, teaches theological anthropology. She uh, she besides uh, working at the institute, she's also the the editor of uh, Humanum, the Issues in Family, Culture, and Science, which is an online journal that uh, the institute uh, produces. Very interesting. You found this on your. Um, tables, so there is the, uh, the website humanumreview.com, just uh, uh, don't do it now, but uh, make sure you visit uh, later. Right. She's also uh, the author of the book Torn Asunder, that uh, deals with the, um, the how divorce affect, uh, affect, uh, affects children, not published last, uh, last year. Her talk is titled Humane Vitae and the Ungendering of Gender. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McCarthy. Thank you. I too want to thank this wonderful university and its wonderful president for having this, this great conference. Let me dive right in. In the Ab Abolition of Man, C.S. Lewis listed contraception as one of the several new inventions that had given us unprecedented power over our nature. But as Lewis noted, the possession of this very power required that whole generations also be subjects to it in the form of selective breeding. Looking ahead to what he thought was the inevitable implication of separating the inseparable meanings, Lewis predicted the man molding by conditioners who would be about the business of cutting out their, po their posterity in whatever shape they pleased. Now with much water under the bridge, there's little question about the accuracy of this prediction. But to that prediction, we can now add something equally disturbing about the other meaning of sex, the ostensible beneficiary of contraception, an observation about how much the human couple has become subject to a power they thought they were yielding. It would be hard to deny how much the union of man and woman itself has changed by their new power, notwithstanding the once noble goals of improving the state of their union by focusing on it more single-mindedly, so to speak. We are brought right to the heart of the new idea of gender. Gender, in its new coinage, at one and the same time dissociates sex from children and the sexes from each other. It engenders gender, it ungenders real gender, separating the sexes from each other, which in turn separates the next generation from the two genders. Now it is no longer engendered. The broken circle is complete. What God has joined has been put asunder at every level. In the following, I look at the question of the inseparability of the two meanings. I do this by looking first at the separation of the inseparable meanings at the heart of the new gender theory. I then turn positively to the inseparability doctrine, humane vitae, to look at the sense in which the two meanings stand or fall together, while taking up the challenge for which gender is pr the purported solution. Let me begin by noting what is implied in the Latin root of the English word, gender. Gender indicates a threefold relation, one with one's forebears, I am engendered, one with the opposite sex, I am gendered, and one with one's potential progeny, I am capable of generating. Let me say a brief word about the first of these relations. By the simple fact of being sexual, we are the kinds of beings that are brought into existence through the sexual process. The fact that we come to be through sexual generations means that we are caught up in a cycle of birth and death. Sexual difference brings to light the most basic difference between us and God. We are finite creatures. As sexual beings, our conception marks the beginning of our parents' death and ours too. There are, of course, asexual organisms that come into being and are quickly replaced by new individuals of their species through asexual reproduction. Sexuality is not, therefore, identical with finitude. But what the sexual process makes more visible is the deeper logic of finitude, 
namely the fact that we exist by virtue of and for the sake of a communion, a co-unity. The sexual process shows the positive side of finitude, so to speak. To state the obvious, the sexual process gives rise to a progeny which is the fruit of the unity of one sex with another, a unity of two. What is more, in the hierarchy of organisms, going from simple to more complex, this unity of two becomes progressively more a unity of two. As for the two, sexual difference at the lowest end of life is found within the same individual, whereas in higher forms of life it occurs between two distinct individuals, in which case sexual difference becomes a full-fledged relation to an outside, to another. As for unity, reproduction in sexual beings at the lowest level of life occurs generally outside the body, involving the least amount of parental unity and parental care of progeny. Whereas at the highest levels of life, reproduction takes place inside the body, involving the highest degree of parental unity and parental care and education of progeny, well beyond birth, where the inside even becomes extended to a home. Simone de Beauvoir noted this direct relation between higher organisms and their relation to and dependence on the outside at the beginning of her famous tome, but considered it problematic because of the implications for the female. The human female, she said, was the most deeply alienated of all female, female mammals. The alternative to this way of interpreting the phenomena is to look at it positively, as Hans Jonas, who noted, as Hans Jonas did, when he noted the dialectical nature of organisms in their ascent up the ladder of organic life. Namely that, as their relation to the outside increases progressively, so does their individuality or in itselfness. When we finally get to the human being, the coincidence of extremes, extreme relation to the outside, and extreme individuality is manifest in the person who is at once a someone and deeply situated within a field of relations, having both a proper name and a family name. Indeed, at this point, human beings do not simply replace their forebears. They mourn their death and keep them alive through the memory of intergenerational bonds, even going so far as to hope to see them one day in the flesh. In sum, at the height of sexual life, we find that being engendered, we owe ourselves to and find ourselves in unities in difference of the most extreme kind, that is, communities of persons where the members are the most distinct as individuals and the most deeply embedded with each other, with the other members. This is especially the case as the horizontal communion of persons opens up vertically and becomes an ultimate reality within the community of the saints, where our finitude is taken up in infinitude. Today's gender calls all of this into question, most basically the fact of our being born. The very term itself is set up alongside the term sex to suggest that it is something else, thus hiding and neutralizing the latter. We should not be distracted by rare disorders of the genetic or hormonal kind originating at some point in utero, nor by psychosomatic disorders. These are not undramatic and they're not unimportant, but the point is that gender in its current usage does not ultimately require any of this, even if it makes use of it for purposes of public argument, especially in the Catholic world, so used is it to the natural law arguments about the way one is born. The idea of gender means to release us precisely from the way we are born. Gender is the attempt to eliminate any pre-existing ground to open up the way for our reconception. Judith Butler, who is on the avant-garde of all of this, insists on this point when she rejects all metaphysical nouns, being, substance, self, sex, things we might call givens. Gender for her is a verb, a performance, which makes all of these. It is the groundless deed performed on ourselves, a sort of creation ex nihilo, it's the ultimate expression of modernity's stalemate between person and nature, where a person means pure will standing over and against his nature. The idea of gender underwent a long incubation period, well before it was introduced to the current dictionary. It can be traced back to early feminism, then followed through its various waves and alongside the homosexual movement. 
Gender makes much use of the nature-culture, nature-nurture distinction, which had become a dualism in modernity, such that any evidence of development through upbringing and education became proof of something simply imposed on nature, which for its part had lost its teleological relation to the outside, to parents, to society, to educators, and to the other sex. More to the point, the alleged imposition is taken to be the fruit of a nefarious scheme of subjection. It is interesting to note how vehement is the insistence about gender as a social construct, especially in the face of all the bodily evidence to the contrary. One radical feminist puts it this way, patriarchy is so powerful that it has a successful habit of passing itself off as nature. But Judith Butler is the most vehement in her insistence that there is no there there when she claims that the very appearance of a given nature is itself the effect of a discourse, which is so clever that it makes the alleged nature look original, while really behind it lurks something more original, namely power or gender border control. The argument for gender is as a mere social construct, thus has been thoroughly inoculated against any contrary evidence. In sum, gender exists to hide any trace of a reality lying underneath it. Even more though, gender's hiding is a resistance to the reality it hides. Specifically, it resists the three relations implied in the etymology of the very word it takes for itself. Historically, the idea of gender as a social construct was aimed at feminism's dominant concern, then and always, the problem of the child for the woman. Considered to be at odds with her humanity and an obstacle to her equality with men, who being less involved concretely in the having and raising of the child, have been able to pursue distinctly human interests, single-mindedly. The woman, said de Beauvoir, is in servitude of maternity, which in itself is already alienating and of no benefit to the woman. What is worse, though, is that the state of affairs puts her in a deep state of dependency on the father of her children, who for his part is complicit in the grand scheme of alienating the woman as his other. For de Beauvoir, just as the two servitudes went hand in hand, so did her independence from the child require independence from the man. And in the history that developed, this putting into question of that meaning took the form of either making the sexes interchangeable or setting them apart from one another or finally turning them in a different orientation altogether. In sum, gender frees the mother for her child and then woman from the man. Since the one thing they cannot have without the other has been put into question, now they are no longer in indispensable to each other. Now that the two meanings have been separated, the two relations can be resisted in another form. It should come as no surprise that gender brings back the child on new grounds. Gender is a close ally with artificial reproductive technology which makes sex no longer indispensable for having children, not only in the sense that it replaces the sexual act, but that it tends ever more toward the elimination of the sexes altogether, be it through cloning or the coaxing of gametes out of stem cells. ARTs give future parents mastery over their reproductive limits, its timing, its heteronormativity, not to mention its control, its lack of control over results but they also free future children from the burden of being born, however counterintuitive it may be to think of emancipation for children who are deliberately constructed, made, that is, not begotten. This is what gender does for us. It sunders woman from child, man from woman, then child from mother and father. Let us note something about the character of gender's resistance to the three relations. The resistance does not consist in making them altogether disappear. To the contrary, it makes them very apparent. Indeed, they are all appearance and no substance. This is clear in the extravagant use that gender makes of leftover packaging, everything that is actually inessential to sexual difference, if not immaterial. The much maligned stere stereotypes, such as preference for lipstick, maxi skirts, and the like, which now detach as they are from the essence of sexual difference, really are stereotypes. Let me note too that the reason gender resists what is essential to sexual difference, being born of a mother, 
being capable of one flesh union, being capable thereby of begetting children, is that it, each of these relations puts us in a given order of things prior to our choosing. But again, the relations are not simply put away. They are brought back in and on new terms. First, they are vehemently declared not to be natural or prior against all appearances. Then they are declared to be mere choices or options available to the indeterminate will and under its control and management. Having a child is a choice with built-in returns policies. Unions are voluntary, they're relationships. Even the child's relation to his parents is reconceived along contractual terms, he being a putative adult with whom the parents are in constant negotiation. And of course, our own relation to our very selves, our gender, is a renegotiable choice. It may well be that the majority of people still happen to choose according to the evidence of their bodies. They may still get married to the opposite sex, conceive children the old-fashioned way, and identify themselves as the gender that happens to line up with their bodies. But the key is that they do these things not because they're consenting to some prior arrangement, but simply because they have chosen it. Nevertheless, the more emphatically the chosen relation contravenes the original form, substituting it with another option, the more it demonstrates successful resistance to the idea that we are constituted prior to our choice. This is why the old aberration will be the new norm, and the old norm will become ever more suspect, the stubborn resistance of reality to our free resistance. It is in this precise sense of resistance that gender can be said to be diabolical in the deepest sense as that which separates things that belong together and then reunites them transformed and on its own terms. We can see how much the forced separation of inseparable things necessarily changes those things. They stand and fall together. Why do we do this? We have already hinted at a reason. To be in a given order which places us in a prior relation to another strikes us as negative, as confining. In being born, we arrive on the scene caught up in a set of arrangements we did not sign up for. We find ourselves already facing a certain direction, standing as we do at a gender border control. And our futures are not simply in our hands or our dreams. We think, we think of these aspects of the given order as negative because they are limitations on our freedom of movement. They are operations of power, and therefore fundamentally unsafe, not only because of the occasional, even frequent abuse, but by definition. They are the fronts of the war of all against all. We may avoid the war altogether, as some feminist pacifists have urged us to do, those who say that sex is by definition rape, or we may enter the fray and simply stay protected containing the war by observing the rules of engagement. That would be contraception. In any event, even where there is no apparent antagonism in the three relations, the antagonism is assumed. This is why they have been banished from the state of nature and brought back in on safer contractual grounds. Essentially, this perception of antagonism is tied to the dominant conception of freedom, according to which freedom is no longer in a prior relation to an objective good. We have already noted how this came to expression in the person-nature stalemate, where person, now a pure, undetermined will, stands over and against or indifferently to his nature. To this, we could add that person, instead of being defined by relation, in, in which that same nature catches him up, stands over and against or indifferently to that. Weariness about the relations in which we are caught up is understandable. We do abuse each other. And we are always doing so. But what is new here is that we have made this abuse the first, last, and most definitive word about our relations to each other. They are, by definition, unsafe. It is not good to be together. A son, a daughter, a man, a woman, a mother, a father. Returning to the reason why we seek to jettison the natural human relations, we might wonder whether in doing so we actually succeed in securing more freedom for ourselves and greater individuality. Recall that it is because there is always a relation behind or inside every substance that Butler wants to jettison substance altogether because to be anything would mean to be entrapped in a relation that is by definition an operation of power. 
Absent those, there is and can be no subject, no self, no I. There is only fluidity. One can see here the traces of the devil's bargain, where having the whole world by circumventing the limits of the natural relations marked on and in our sexually distinct bodies really does come at the cost of one's very soul, that is, of being anything in particular. We have just seen that in the discussion of gender, the gender project, how much gender is dominated by separation. All of this, of course, is only possible because of the separation of the two meanings of the sexual act, without which men and women would be indispensable to each other and they to their children. This is the negative illustration of Humanae Vitae's central point, that the two meanings stand and fall together. Let me say a word about each of, the, of these two meanings and their inseparability, paying a special attention to the chief interest of those in favor of separation, that is, the concern over power and instrumentalization and the desire for freedom, a just desire. It is well known that before the council, some charged that the teaching of the church on the end of marriage appeared to instrumentalize marriage and the act belonging to it. This charge, of course, assumes a notion of end which is extrinsic to an action, not the end belonging to our tradition, the teleological one, which coincides with the fullness of an action, the marriage act in this case. That said, from the side of the theology of marriage, it was possible to ask just where conjugal love was. In many ways, the development of the theology of marriage before and during the council, with its increasing emphasis on the sacredness, dignity of marriage, its status as a state of life, and therefore its specific contribution to the universal call to love, was the necessary response to the perception of instrumentalization. Moreover, it was precisely the manner in which the theology of marriage was developed that procreation was not placed next to love, but included in it, thus deepening both conjugal love and its end. This becomes explicit in Humanae Vitae, of course, when it speaks of fruitfulness as constitutive of conjugal love. In sum, it was the deepening of the th theology of marriage that the procreative end found itself on more secure ground. As a result, it became clear that far from instrumentalizing conjugal love, the openness to procreation was a condition for conjugal love to be itself. Part of seeing how little the openness to the procreative end instrumentalizes conjugal love is to see how that same openness prevents the instrumentalization of the lovers themselves. It is hard to deny now that we have lived for decades with the separation of the meanings how poorly the unity between man and woman has fared. In sum, has not the separation led to the reduction of persons to means, to private ends, to persons trapped with op within operations of power, the very thing the protection was meant to prevent. To put it in terms of the contraceptive debate, where have all the personal values gone? Where has all the love gone? Looking at things positively, let me say something about um, how the meanings are protected by, through inseparability. But much has been said already about how the openness to the child is necessary to love, uh, necessary to keep love, love. So I'm gonna move right along to uh, to look at inseparability from the other side. Let me say something about inseparability that is from the other side, where we, where we show how um, the unity of the parents is necessary in order to keep procreation, procreation, especially with respect to the concern over instrumentalization and power and freedom. If the two meanings of the conjugal act are inseparable, then the unity of spouses is necessary for procreation. One of the obvious ways in which we can see that conjugal love is not instrumentalization or instrumentalized in the long tradition of opposition to contraception is the church's own injunction against any form of procreation which circumvents the conjugal act or indeed of other older methods of procuring children in the event of sterility, which methods circumvented marriage, such as divorce, polygamy, or concubinage. It was, of course, the role of Donum Vitae to address the circumvention of the Marriage Act. And I hold Donum Vitae just to be the other side of Humanae Vitae, basically. Essentially, the heart of Donum Vitae's injunction against the separation of the conjugal act from procreation was that the child would become subject to a dominion characteristic of things made, not begotten. 
This substitution of the act of begetting belonging to natural things, including human beings, by which they bear fruit, with the technical act of making, says Donum Vitae, establishes the domination of technology over the origin and destiny of the human person. We are reminded of Lewis's conditioners who can now cut out their posterity in whatever shape they please, designing them and subjecting them inevitably to quality control. Again, Hans Jonas is great on this, on the, on the importance of the, the child's, uh, the, the right to ignorance. The child has a right to ignorance. Um, so that his parents aren't designing him. The issue goes well beyond good, the good intentions of well-meaning parents filled with a natural desire for something very good, but of a kind of action which has domination at its very logic. When a child is the direct object of its parents' design, the child has become a means to an end measured by their criteria. It has become an object of an operation of power. The church's injunction against this side of the separation is helpful for understanding its injunction against the other side, especially in the face of the objection that the couple has been made a mere means to the end of a child. For here one can see that the child not being a means to an end must also come from an activity which is not simply a means to an end, a biological factory. The German philosopher Robert Spemann's comment is elucidating and funny when he says, as though speaking to his children, don't believe I was thinking of you when I was with your mother. The child, of course, can be wanted, but only as a fruit of an act of mutual, gratuitous, and uncalculating self-forgetfulness. It's kind of what sex is. Returning to the child, the injunction against the separation of conjugal union from procreation involves a deepening of just what procreation is, that is, of what children are. Unlike lower sexual organisms, human children remain with their parents well beyond birth because, their need, because of their need to be raised and educated. Adolf Portman speaks of the child's need for a second uterine year in the womb of the family, since only in the family does the human child learn to speak, stand upright, and walk. But this need, that this need goes further. The need being human is not only for food and shelter, learning how to speak, learning how to walk, but also to be brought up into a human community, beginning with the first community of one's parents. The insistence on the unity of parents as a constitutive dimension of the child be it in the child's coming to be, be it in his or her long education, is simply a recognition, a recognition of what the child is, a being from, a being with, and a being for a communion of persons. Any relaxing of that unity of the parents, on the contrary, implies a, simply a different conception of what the child is, either by thinking of him as an object of domination or the subject of resistance to the fact of givenness. The former is evident in all the myriad of ways in which children have been put to the test, literally, in laboratories by the conditioners. The latter has been in view for far longer, beginning with the leniency of liberalism towards divorce. When John Locke approved a divorce on the grounds that the end of marriage was procreation, he was not wrong about the end so much as that in which it consisted. Taking the procreation education of children seriously means to take seriously the love of parents for each other, which is, as Humanae Vitae says, a condition of the sincerest care of the offspring. Here we can address what is often the most difficult challenge to the teaching of Humanae Vitae, namely that most of the time in the life of a married couple, they are infertile, including during their fertile years and that they, unlike animals beneath them, are not without sexual interests outside the windows of fertility. Given all of this, how can the church say that each and every marital act must of necessity retain its intrinsic relationship to the procreation of human life? Augustine famously interpreted the procreate event to imply the wrongfulness in the form of a venial sin of a conjugal act that was not consciously intentionally procreative or during infertile times. But the church does not follow him on this. How can the church, though, maintain its principle, each and every marital act must of necessity retain its intrinsic relations, et cetera, et cetera, without following Augustine on his practical application of the principle? A frequent way to read the principle is to say that spouses do retain their intrinsic relationship to pro procreation, but 
simply by not thwarting it. This principle brought to bear often on the difference between contraception and periodic continence in NFP is an important one and valid. Still, it is hard in my view, to see how this minimal reading can be used to read the use of infertile times positively as retaining their intrinsic relationship to procreation. Might it not be better to interpret the principle in a more maximal and positive way by looking at infertility as a feature of the kind of procreation and education that belongs to the human couple? And with respect to the claim that is often made that the general infertility of the human couple shows and proves that spouses are not only for procreation, we could say, instead, on the contrary, that they are more deeply for procreation, since their sexuality takes into account the kind of progeny they are apt for conceiving. Children need time with their parents to learn from them many things, chiefly about the communion of persons that put them in being, that marks them now, and that asks to be taken up by them in the future. In this sense, the love of spouses for each other is always a primary education and always, therefore, retains its intrinsic relation to procreation, as the church, together with Augustine, insists. We saw that the unengendering of gender exists to drive a wedge between the person and his or her nature, so as to drive a further wedge between the person and the three fundamental relations of that same nature. We saw, furthermore, that the move of resistant separation is driven by the concern for safety, for the individual, for his freedom. In light of the dialectical relation between the relation, relation and individual, however, we asked what success the gender project could possibly have when the very subject of freedom has to be sacrificed to fluidity in order to be free. Turning to Humanae Vitae, we looked especially at the doctrine of inseparability with its claim that the two meanings can only stand unseparated. Gender theory already makes this clear negatively. But what we see with Humanae Vitae is that inseparability is not only the condition for saving conjugal love, but also the condition for keeping man, woman, and child truly safe as personal subjects in relation, who don't have to sacrifice their very selves, their souls, in order to be free. As John Paul II said, so-called safe sex, which is touted by the civilization of technology, is actually radically not safe. Indeed, it is extremely dangerous. It endangers the person, and what is this danger? It is the loss of the truth about one's own self, together with the risk of the loss of his freedom. Thank you. Thank you.